very happy to introduce the, the final speaker and our co-organizer, Professor Jean Ponce. Uh, Jean was actually the first French person I ever met in my life. Um, I was 22 years old. That was about 32 years ago at the University of Illinois. I was a starting graduate student, and he was a starting assistant professor. And he was a great uh, friend and mentor at the time. Um, certainly well, very well known for his uh, um, work in computer vision, his book, and many contributions to um, recognition and uh, image reconstruction and synthesis and video as well. Um, I, I also appreciate his research in the same sense that I appreciate uh, Jean-Paul's work. They, they both have a deep connection to mathematics and bring a lot of that kind of tradition into, um, into their research over the years. Um, most of his career is spent at the University of Illinois. About a decade or so ago, he came back to France where he uh, has led a group at Enria and also was a director of the Department of Computer Science at the, at the very prestigious uh, Ecole Normale. Um, and then for the last several years, he's been at NYU in uh, New York City. So um, so very happy to, um, to uh, <laughs> introduce you. So. Thank you, thank you very much, Steve. Thank you. Uh, I'm not just at NYU. I'm also spending half of my time in France. But but okay, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. He's chattering. Uh, yeah, so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, so I'm very happy to be here and to welcome you. Um, I've been friends with Jean-Paul for over 30 years, and uh, we have never managed to to publish a paper together. Um, but uh, and then in December we lost Jean-Paul. It was a huge shock for our team and for all of the community, and that. You know, we'll miss him forever. It was, uh, it was really a huge loss, and especially for his students and the people around him, and of course, his friends. On a more, uh, on a happier note, I've never published a paper with John, John Paul yet, but I am lucky to be the co-advisor of his last PhD student, uh, Yann de Montmarin, who is in the back over there. And I'm going to talk about his work. And this is unpublished work. Maybe there are bugs, who knows? Um, but I think it's very interesting, and I think Jean-Paul would have liked it. I mean, Jean-Paul knew it. He started to jump in uh, later. Um, this morning, we started with uh, Philippe Swear, who I think, if I'm not mistaken, was Jean-Paul's second PhD student. Is that correct? And so now I'm going to talk about the work of his last PhD student. The two are related. I'm going to talk about uh, configuration spaces, distances, shortest paths, and things like that, and, and, uh, and uh, metric balls, which are things that uh, Jean-Paul liked. Um, and I think you will enjoy it. I hope you will enjoy it. All right, so after, after we started this work, we, uh, we came upon this, this uh, citation by, from uh, James Kufner, where he said that, you know, ideally, if you want to study the motion of a, of a solid in SE3, what you would like to do is to do it in terms of um, sweat volumes. Why? Because if you can minimize the sweat volumes, hopefully, uh, as you move, you will occupy uh, a smaller amount of space, and to be, you will be less likely to hit obstacles. They said it was, unfortunately, too complicated and expensive to do. And, uh, and what this paper is about is really trying to put a, a, a metric structure on configuration space uh, using this idea of, uh, of uh, mi minimizing the sweat volume, uh, sweat volume of our trajectory. So on the right, you have an example of, uh, of, a, of a rod moving in, uh, in E2 in the plane. Um, on the left side, you have the animation where you do the, the, the shortest path in x, y, theta space, if you want. And on the, on the, on the far right, you have, uh, you have uh, the geodesics that are found with the sweat volume distance I'm going to talk to you about. Uh, using uh, Jan's implementation. I'm not going to, I'm going to talk purely about theoretical stuff today. I'm not going to talk about, I will show another, one more example of his implementation at the end, but I'm not going to talk about algorithms. I'm going to talk about ideas and, and uh, how, you can, how you can come up with this kind of, of notions. When Jan and Jean-Paul uh, started this work, they were focusing on, on, uh, on actual robots. I mean, first on, uh, and just solid in E3, and then on, uh, on polyarticulated robots. But, but then we took a step back, and we decided to look at a slightly more abstract problem. So it's the idea of uh, characterizing configuration space of deformable shapes in a fine Euclidean space. OK? So um, here, um, uh, so, so think of the shapes as, as robots. And we'll see the, the relationship with robots later. But it's deformation, deformable shapes. They have constant volume, and each instant of this shape is a, is a regular compact body in E3. By regular, I mean in the usual uh, CAD, uh, CAD system uh, 
meaning of the term that is the thing that is the uh, closure of the interior uh, of its interior. Okay, and so we we assumed that that they have constant volume, and we are not going to parameterize configuration space. The configuration space is the set, the set of all configurations, and the configuration is just one instance of this deformable body. Okay. Now I can, if I equip uh, this configuration space as a, as a subset of E3, if you want, uh, with, I mean, if I equip E3 with the uh, Hausdorff uh, topology, I can define continuous path as a continuous function from, uh, from the 0, 1 interval to, uh, to, the, to, to the set of all bodies. And then the region swept along that path by my deformable body will be just the union of our, of our, the, the path of all the instances of the body. And I will now define the sweat volume as the volume of that, that region, and then the incremental sweat volume as the volume of that region minus the constant volume of the object. So in this thing, the sweat volume is the orange thing plus the two, the two blue, blue regions over that path, and uh, the incremental volume is the whole thing minus either the volume at the beginning or the volume at the end. Okay. So it's very simple definition, quite general. And the nice thing is that, uh, and this is an example when you take a rectangle in the plane and you sweep it along some trajectory. So the, the whole sweat volume will be the, whole, the orange plus the red, and the incremental sweat volume will just be the red part. And not, not very surprisingly, uh, you can show that if you take the infimum of the sweat volume of all possible path joining one configuration to another one, this defines a distance, a proper distance on configuration space. So we are actually surprised by this because uh, this is intuitively fairly, uh, I mean, it's not surprising, I would say. And we thought that this, if this were true, this would be a, a well-known property. And it probably is. It's probably in some textbook somewhere, but we haven't found it. OK? So how do you prove it? It's actually very easy. Uh, all the the fact that it's non-negative is trivial. The fact that it's that it's uh, you have the triangular inequality is almost trivial. Uh, the only thing that you need to be a bit careful is to show that when the distance is zero, then the two bodies are the same. And there, this is where, where you use the fact that you are looking over uh, regular bodies. Okay, I'm not going to go into detail, but it's a free line proof. So it, it's very simple. So this is nice. It was, again, we are, we are surprised that this was not known. We haven't found it. Maybe it's known. I've talked to people with the optimal transport and all that. No, they told me we don't know about that. But maybe, maybe it's in a textbook. So, one of, so this was nice, but uh, one of the things that Jan wanted to do is to, um, is to come up with a, with a metric structure where you, can, uh, you, can, where you, are, you, have, you are guaranteed that you have geodesics in that, in that metric structure and that you can compute them. Okay, but unfortunately, the, this distance here is not a geodesic distance because as you sweep your body over, along a trajectory, you are going to count a region that is visited once, only twice, only once. And so uh, 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 geodesic distance, we want that it be the sum of the geodesic distance about the, the two subpaths. And, and because these properties will not be true in general. Okay? So we had to come up, or Jan and Jan and Jan and Jean Paul had to come up with an alternate definition. And one of the things I like, I will forget to say it, one of the things I don't like parametrizations, I don't like equations, I don't like any of that stuff. Here this is totally coordinate free, parametriz parametrization free. I don't look at parametrization of SE free or anything like that. But we are going to look at something slightly more abstract. We don't know anything about solid mechanics, but we looked at a bunch of articles and came up and looked at how people really talked about configuration spaces so in mechanics. And a typical way to do it is to say you have some reference body in some space, and then you have mappings from that reference body to uh, instances of the reference bodies. Okay? And in our case, the reference body is going to be once again a regular solid in E3. And then we are going to look at uh, mappings that are isochoric, so kind of pretentious world, but it's shorter than volume and orientation preserving, but it's all that it means. So we are going to look at mappings that, that preserve volume and orientation. And we are going to assume that those are different morphisms from E3 into itself. And very importantly, we are going to assume that the mapping between 
the diffeomorphism in the corresponding body instance is injective. Okay, and why is this important? Because we want, what we want is to identify the, the set of diffeomorphism that I'm going to call Q, and each configuration I will call small Q. Big Q is a set of diffeomorphism, you understand me? And small Q is one, one of these functions. And I want to identify Big Q to the, all the configurations of the body, all the instances of the body. And when the, when the, the mapping, when this mapping is injective, then indeed it is, there you have a bijection between the set of diffeomorphism and the set of all instances of your body. Okay? So, so far, so good. After we, we did that work, we found that uh, paper by, uh, by my friend George Burdick and I guess one of his students that were looking at good representation for, for 3D solids. And of course, they have the same representation, but again, it comes from solid, solid mechanism. That's not surprising. But in their case, they are looking at solid bodies. Here, we are looking at deformable objects. So now, equipped with the notion, the idea was to look for some differential definition of the sweat volume. So you have a body that is transforming along a trajectory. Trajectory is going to be a set of these deformorphisms. And as it deforms from the one instance, the one at times t plus delta t, you are going to have an increment in volume on the, on the right side. And if you integrate these increments over the full trajectory, you will have another definition of the sweat volume. Okay? Um, so we are going to make a few assumptions, simplify stuff, to be able to talk simply about derivatives and stuff. We are going to equip space with the coordinate system. I will not talk about coordinate system anymore later, but it's just so that we can identify E3 and R3. All the results I'm going to show you are totally independent of choice of, of coordinate system. I'll not prove it to you, but it's true. And then I will... This, and so this time, a differential path. A path is what? You take some interval i of the real lane, and it's a map from i cross R3 into R3, such that uh, any element, uh, gamma t, so gamma t is defined as the thing that associates to a point in the reference body, um, the, uh, the value of gamma at times t and in, in, chi, in chi, 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 I'm, I'm tired. So such that this mapping is an element of your configuration space, okay? So it's just a path of deformorphism. And then, of course, we can define the derivative of the configuration, the time derivative of the configuration, at the partial derivative of gamma with respect to time. OK? So, and this partial derivative lives in a tangent space to the configuration space in gamma t. All right. Likewise, if I pick a configuration Q and a velocity that is a vector in the tangent space to, to capital Q in, in small Q, then this will induce a velocity, a velocity field on the full space R3. And this velocity field will be diver, divergence, divergence free because we are conserving volume. All this, all this is easy. You get a simple formula for the, the velocity field. It's Q dot, that is the time derivative of uh, gamma in, in key, in chi, key, key, chi, chi, whatever. And then you have a Q minus one because you want to go back from chi to X, okay? So now I have this velocity field, it's defined everywhere. And let's take a close up. This is what we are going to look at. We have, we have our body at times T, our body at times T, T plus delta T. Part of the body T is going to get inside the next instance. It will be, that's the incoming flux, if you want, it will be an outgoing flux that the part is going to go outside, that's a new part, and what you want to do is measure that new part, and that's what you are going to do to compute your, the, 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 the differential of the, of the volume, if you want. So you define the flux as the integral over the boundary of your body at times t of the max of the dot product of the velocity, the velocity field with the normal to the boundary. Okay? You take the max, it's measured on that because you don't want to count the incoming flux, just the outgoing flux, the extra space you are going to use. Okay? And then given that, you can define the volume swept, swept along the path as the integral of the thing from zero to one. And this will coincide with the, the previous definition of the swept volume, except in spaces where you visit the same region at least twice. Okay? And of course, you can define a function that's going to be the infimum of all possible differential 
path, differentiable path joining B0 to B1 of that volume. Question, is that distance? And does that distance admit um, geodesics? So you can guess the answer, yes, and there are some hypotheses, it will. But before I do that, again, in this case, we don't, we don't count this region a single time. Because we take the increments, we'll count it as we enter it, but we'll count it again as we visit it again. Okay, so it, we can be hopeful that maybe we'll have, we have a ge geodesic structure with that thing. So the, main, the second main result is that under relatively mild assumptions, D prime, this new, this new measure, is indeed the distance of the configuration space. And under some extra assumption, when Q equipped with D prime is locally compact, complete, and path connected, and this will be true in, in many cases, in particular if you look at uh, rigid solids or articulated bodies, non intersecting bodies, then any pair QQ prime of configuration is Q is connected by, connected by a geodesic, which is exactly what we are. Okay? All right, so how do we prove that? Well, we, have to, we need to prove a lemma, which is the fact that the function that associates with Q dot, the flux, defines the norm about the tension space to the configuration space in Q. If you have that lemma, then it's easy. Well, it's easy. No, you have to use strong results from differential geometry, but, but they, come, you, they come from textbooks, okay? You use the elementary Finslerian geometry, and you have to, for Finslerian geometry, you have to talk to Jan because I'm, I wouldn't say I'm rusty, I don't know anything about it. And you use well known theorems about, about this kind of stuff. But the, the key is to prove that, that lemma. What are the mild assumptions? Well, the mild between codes. The first assumption is again that the mapping between configurations and the corresponding bodies be injective. The second one is a bit more involved, so I need to discuss it now. All right, so let's have a close-up. This is a close-up, that thing. So we have, my, again, my body at times t, at times t plus delta t, and here in orange, I've, I've represented uh, you know, a bit of the, the path, the path swept by, by, by my thing. Okay? So, of course, the, the velocity field v of vqq dot changes with time. You know, it's defined at q is equal to gamma t, so it changes with time. But you can also think of it as a stationary field defined as empty. So you take the value of v q q dot at time t, and you have these arrows everywhere in R3. You have the receiver everywhere in R3. Okay? It's not evolving. You fix it. And then what you can do is look at its integral lines. So you, have, you, take, a, you take this point here, for example. You know, it will, it's, it's, its trajectory will be a curve like this. And likewise, in serving this body, we'll have new instances of that body before and after formed by tracking these integral lines. Okay? The thing that you obtain is a new path, gamma uh, with the exponent q, q, q dot. Of course, this new path is different from the original one. We call that a canonical extension because we think it's a pretty nice name. And you can easily show that it's also isochoric, that is also preserves volume. OK? Is that OK? It's a simple one. All right, so now we can define our second assumption. The second assumption is that, at least locally, the canonical extension over a small interval, maybe, the canonical extension is itself a configuration. And again, in many, uh, many uh, favorable cases, this, this will be true. If this condition is not true, or if the condition about injectivity is not true, then the lemma is false and the theorem is false as well. So these are really, ne the two conditions are necessary. How do we know that? Because we have simple counterexamples. Okay? But with this assumption, it's quite easy to prove the lemma. The, the, you know, uh, maybe I should say that in the next one. Yeah, ah, here is the proof, the informal proof of the lemma. First, we can rewrite the flux. Instead of having the max of zero and the dot product, you'd say just half of the absolute value. Why is that true? Because the volume is conserved. So the outgoing flux must be equal to the incoming flux. Okay? So we have that. So now, the fact that the, the, 
This function is non-negative, is obvious. It's homogeneous as well. Subadditive, it's easy. It becomes some linearity of that product and, and, and subadditive of absolute value. So the only thing that's, that's still non-trivial is to show that when, the, when the, this function is zero, then q dot must be zero. If you have shown that, then you know it's a norm. OK? So how can you show that? Well, when this thing is zero, the absolute value of the dot product must be zero everywhere. That means that the velocity field must be tangent to the boundary of the body. OK? In particular, it means that the integral lines of that field starting on the boundary will stay on the, on the boundary. OK? And in fact, so this is in 2D, but it's true in 3D, and because the thing is compact and regular and all that, uh, you can show that if it's this case, then, uh, then the, the, the value, the, the body associated with gamma, gamma of QQ dot in T, whatever T in this small epsilon will be the body itself. Okay, that's simple to show. So what, what do we have now? We have a stationary, station, stationary path whose value is constant and is BQ. And because we have injectivity, if we have this, I mean, rather, if we have this because of injectivity, then we have this. Then gamma T of QQ dot is equal to Q. That means that gamma is stationary. The derivative with respect to T is equal to zero. That means that Q dot is equal to zero. We are done. OK? So well, I went really fast. <laughs> so that's all, that's all there really is to it. So three, three, four things to finish. So this is for deformable bodies. But this applies. <coughs> I was taught when I was a kid that you shouldn't say trivially, but this applies immediately to regular rigid bodies in E3. It applies also immediately to polyarticulated robots without self-intersection. It can be extended to uh, polyarticulated robots with self-intersections, but then, of course, the geodesics you compute may not be physically re um, realizable. Maybe it will be useful in practice. I think that the practical thing is neither mine or, or, or Jan's main thing, but, but still. So Jan did some easy implement it. So you, can, you can compute the trajectories. Did some initial implementation using RT to do path planning. This is using RT and the usual you know, metric in, in configuration space. This is using the new metric. And as you can see, you explore fewer nodes. And you have better connectivity between the nodes. So it seems to work pretty well. But who knows if it will be useful in practice. We thought about this this morning when we saw Philip's talk. What about, does it apply to, to cars? We don't know if H2 is, is satisfied for cars. It would be cool. And, and what, what would the optimal paths look like and wheelchairs and all the like? So we don't know. So we thought about it this morning. We should have thought about it before, but we'll think harder. And then we can draw cool balls, and Jean-Paul would have loved that. And since, since Jean-Paul loved printing uh, balls, we will print them uh, very soon. And I'm going to stop there. This is, I like this picture. This is a few weeks before we lost Jean-Paul. He had an organized workshop at the Agony des Sciences, and he's full regalia, and he's very happy and full of energy. And that's, uh, that's how I like to remember Jean-Paul. And it's Nicolas Ayash who sent it to me this morning. So thank you very much, and I'll stop there. So uh, it was a wonderful day. Uh, many talks on different topics showing uh, different facets of Jean-Paul. And uh, all, the, all the time, the, the conducting uh, stream of uh, the human relationship, the interest for the machine, the mathematics, and also for humans. So I believe that we can explain to a large audience that uh, robotics in no, is not only the science of uh, building machines. Uh, we have to do that. We have to increase the state of the art in this direction. But robotics is also a way of understanding hum humans. I think we saw that uh, it can be about uh, language. It can be about, about uh, life science. So it's a way of building a system 
that is supposed to do a bit of what we are able to do. And I think uh, not a lot of people understand that the robotics that animates us every day in our research is sometimes in that way more than in the fact of uh, finding some industrial solutions to improve the production. Okay, so Jean Paul was a, a pioneer, I think, in this uh, direction. So I would like to thank all of you for sharing this day, uh, for all the, the words that you say and the, the way you, you met Jean Paul and uh, produced something with him. So, thank you. And just, just the last words, I want to thank again, I did this morning, but I want to reiterate, I want to thank Prairie, Alas, and Collège de France for having us and supporting us, Paul Jacobs as well. And again, I want to thank, to thank Stéphane Mala and Albertos and Marie, Marie-Lène Messon de Rennes, who is there, without whom this thing would have never happen. Um, a last word, um, I really hope, I mean, just like Philippe, I really hope that that, that the, especially for me, it has been a blast to see everybody again. It's been a long time, but but for the young people, I hope you, I hope this thing inspires you to follow in the footsteps of Jean Paul and discover, you know, um, what it is to, to look at the relationship between robotics, the world, your science, exactly what Philippe was saying. So I hope it is useful. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you to our speakers and our session chairs. Some of them came from very far, and now we have champagne. <laughs>